VR after the announcement that Facebook bought Oculus. She has since developed several distinct connections with the VR space as an artist showing work at Bitform's gallery, New Tech VR Salon, University Galleries of Illinois, and most recently LACMA with the Her After Institute. As the VR Experience Director at VRB as, uh, at Samsung Accelerator, and as a developer and instructor of a course entitled Directing Virtual Reality uh, at NYU Tisch. Her recent interests in the yard are abstract communication interfaces, the relationship between personal memory and virtual space, and trying to make versions of the future that are challenging, thoughtful, and goofy. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Rocker. online 
uh, with someone who was 20. I used to tell people that I could like interpret their dreams and we would like go on these chats and I would like have people tell me the things they were dreaming about and I would like tell them what it meant. And it, I think it really helped a lot of people, so I don't feel bad about it. But like when I think about what it meant to be like, if I were like a 20 something or a 40 something year old and I knew that the person I was talking to was like 11, I'm not sure how I would react. But for me, it was a mind expanding experience. And I think, you know, McLuhan has been like a theme through this conference. And if there's one thing technology does well, it, it, it brings awareness. New media can bring awareness of things outside of, um, you know, your untechnological state. Um, so, <clears throat> around that time, I, I, you know, I was pretty young when a, a really, really bad day happened that sort of set off a domino effect of events that uh, becomes relevant in my work later. So I'll redo this. It's really sad. Brace yourself. I feel awkward reading this, but I heard it's good to make yourself feel vulnerable during a talk, so. <laughs> this is the worst day of my life. My dad just told me he has Alzheimer's. I do not know what to do, and I can't think. I don't know what to think. No one can help because nobody knows how I feel. The very first thing that I did when I found this out was go into a chat room, and I told Everyone in these chat rooms that I've been going to forever, oh my god, this terrible thing has happened. And I would do research on Wicked, you know, not Wikipedia, Wikipedia didn't exist, but like WebMD, I think was around at that time. And I started getting this vested interest in both how how technology was helping me through this like kind of catastrophic world-shaking event for me, and how technology was expanding my way of thinking about things so I as like a 13 year old could sort of gain an understanding that otherwise I wouldn't of how to frame this disease that my father was going through. So years past, still super addicted to the internet, ready to go to college, actually study poetry, which seems like strange to me now that I decided to do that, but um, I was really pumped because the year that I decided to go to college was the year that the Facebook, do you guys remember what I was talking about that, became open to all of the colleges, and I was like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever, it's such a cool social network. And so, from then on, I became Sarah Rothberg, abandoned my online identities and my online friends and replaced them with my new real friends. And for me, Facebook, at the, at the same time that it was really exciting, it, it, I started to realize that it had this bizarre relationship to my own memory where it became, it became this repository where I was putting all of the things and sort of flipping through all the people's representations of themselves. And over time, I realized like it, it became, who feels like they're addicted to Facebook? Or like whatever, Twitter, Twitch, right? And, and I don't wanna say that that's like necessarily like this is bad, but it's something that's morphing our relationship to each other in a way that I, I, I like to draw some awareness to in my work. So <clears throat> I think we as a society are structured by the technology around us and it can be measured in a small way by how we as individuals are restructured by it. <clears throat> so after I finished being a writer, <laughs> because it I don't know, I just decided I wasn't able to reach enough people with that. I started um, doing visual art and working with technology because my writing was really focused on playing with technology. I was doing work that like, you know, I would co-write a poem with my phone speech to text or I would use like a Wikipedia uh, search to kind of like make an argument of copy pasting things from there. But I realized it would be a lot stronger for me to actually engage with the technology directly as a way of kind of transferring some of the things that I was thinking about it. Um, I started to ask questions like, just questions that turn things that I saw on their head as a way of trying to understand them differently. Like, what if everyone saw what you were scrolling through? Or what if everybody watched Facebook together? Um, and that sort of launched this project, which I think of as like the emotional research that is missing from technology research. Everyone with me so far? Mm -hmm. All right. 
Um, so at that time, I also became really interested in uh, neuroscience. Um, I mean, I had sort of this, like, because of um, my father's condition, I, I had sort of this vested interest in neuroscience. And there became, for me, this connection between Facebook and technology as a repository for your memory and sort of the fragility of biological memory. And I can't really draw the connection in a, in a clear way, which is, I think, why I make artwork about it instead. I think Rachel was talking about, like, as a painter, like, you know, it's hard to talk about your work because it's easier to just show. Um, <laughs> but I, I became sort of interested in this, this, um, this, this theory in neuroscience called reconsolidation, which is whenever you remember something, the context in which you remembered it gets enfolded into the memory. And I realized that Facebook, as the repository for all of our memories, is really becoming part of our memories. And even beyond that, you know, having technology with us all the time means that we're making the memory and experiencing the thing at the same time. And I kind of wanted to feel what some of the effects of that were. So I started doing all these different camera experiments. So this was one where I was like wearing sensors and like a, a webcam on my head, with, like a backpack and recording my day and sort of like sorting it by different biosensor data that I could find, thinking like what are alternative ways that we might be able to think about um, recording, which bizarrely happened in tandem with, you guys remember when Facebook released the first like look back video? And it was these like, who remembers that? Those Okay, so like most of you guys, but there was this algorithm, algorithmically generated, like, cheesy, super cheesy montages of what your life was according, like, according to, like, how many people liked your photo on Facebook. And I was like, this is, seems really innocuous, but actually it's, like, kind of scary. Your identity is already super caught up with this, like, singular online identity that you have by, you know, having your I'm one Sarah Rothberg on Facebook. And when you start to sort of, whether you like it or not, watching those videos will change the way that you conceive of yourself, even if it's like an antithesis. Because you'll, you'll, those moments will get stuck in your, in your mind as part of, of something essential about you. So <clears throat> in line with that kind of work, I started doing a, these first person GoPro videos. And I, th I was thinking a lot about like life logging and what it means to record like everything. So I started recording my, every time I cleaned my apartment for a year with a GoPro, which I thought was funny because, you know, most people use GoPros to like, you know, record jumping off a building or something really extreme. And then <clears throat> viewing them. Making this like future memory 
landscape for myself, I could at least preempt what I could prepare myself that if this is what the future of you know, this Facebook VR look like, I would at least be able to share with others and myself an alternative. So that brings me to the first project in VR that I ever did. I never saw VR, I never tried VR before I made this project, so it was like really strange for me. Um, this was the house that I grew up in. My dad had taken a lot of home videos um, as a kid, when I was a kid, and um, he had this one video where he sort of did this like first person walkthrough of the house right when we moved in. And I was able to use that to, using literally like only cubes in Unity because I didn't know how to 3D model, rebuild the house that I grew up in, um, placing the videos and other pictures throughout the house. So the house was in text uh, textured entirely with uh, photos and videos. You can kind of see on like the door there, like the top of the, um, <clears throat> the videos. And I found that by doing this process, even though it was, you know, a critical kind of like, fuck you Facebook, I'm gonna do this first and see what it's like, I started to realize the power of this format. So things would happen, like when I finally was able to put the headset on and do the walkthrough of the house, it was, making me remember things about the house that just looking at photos of them couldn't recall. So there was there was like a loose tile in a, one of the hallways and I remember like virtual walking over that, that hallway, that little piece of parquet and I was like, oh, I remember that this was loose. And I, I started to understand that there's some connection between spatial, spatializing things and Putting and, and memory. I'm sure, have you guys heard of like the memory palace? So you, you, I'm not going to explain that, but if you are interested in this, you should look it up. And uh, similarly, another really mind blowing thing of that same trajectory is have you guys heard of place cells? I wish I had a slide of this, but it'll blow your noggin off if you're interested in this. But basically, like some neuroscience research, like some neuroscience researchers attached like a little like tiny electrodes to a little rat running through a maze and showed a map of where the mouse was running through the maze. As the mouse was running through the maze, what uh, neurons were fired as it was doing this. And it, it creates like a tiny map. Like you create like a physiological tiny map in your brain, or rats do at least, that mirrors the actual physical world. And so it, when you think about connecting memory with place, it of course it makes perfect sense. You remember things by having neurons fire and in that same way you remember what a space looks like. I, I hope that makes sense to you guys. I'm not sure if that was very clear. I can't really, whatever. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to show you guys my piece so I can stop talking for a minute. VHS 
video. So I had um, also playing when I display this uh, the original VHS tape and the uh, on a CRT monitor for a computer, which I was like, oh, that's, that's funny, those don't go together. Um, so what happened after that was kind of nuts, which was, it was 2014 and I knew how to make VR and people were like contacting me all of a sudden. And I had studied poetry as an undergraduate and I never thought that people from tech companies were gonna be calling me and saying, hey, what can you tell us about VR? And it was sort of like, I was like blindsided by this like influx of interest in what I was doing. So I decided to uh, continue to have a couple, but I don't think I have time to read them. Um, write um, a book of poems about VR, which you can look forward to in the future, because people hate poetry, and that's why you should read it. <laughs> um, I worked on a few different um, collaborations after that. This is a piece that I did with the musician Louis Fu, um, and I was able, as Bella mentioned, to teach uh, actually two classes at uh, ITP. Um, this is one of my students' uh, actually 360 video pieces, but now I'm teaching a class on called DIY VR, which is an interactive, uh, like Unity game engine based uh, class. Um, and working with uh, other artists like Gabe uh, Garcia Colombo on this piece that was recently at LACMA, which was about making a kind of like virtual reality memorial. Um, and then oddly I was hired by a startup to uh, work there, which for me was like the ultimate irony of ironies. And so I was like, all right, that sounds kind of interesting. And because of that, it, I, I feel like I ended up with this like really broad spectrum of an understanding of the VR landscape, but also like a lack of caring about whether or not it succeeds, <coughs> which I think is a great standpoint to be in as an artist because you can, you can be free with your criticality. Um, so I started to imagine, you know, I had this one piece which was like, what is the future of VR going to be like for memory? And then more broadly, I had seen this, I, I had all these different influences and I saw this video. Uh, has anyone seen this uh, UX video by this guy, Mike Alger? It's really, really mind blowing because it's, you know, we all think of these VR experiences that are going to be these like amazing, like moving narrative experiences. But his argument is, you know how like when you want to get a lot of work done, you use like two screens, and if you want to get like a ton of work done, you use like three screens and like five screens, and then he's like, VR is going to be like that, and like all of these like screens of spreadsheets and stuff are just like flying towards his face, and I was like, oh my god, VR is going to be like that. If it succeeds, that's what VR will be, succeeds in that context. So I decided to explore that by making um, a desktop app. Um, which you can see at the VR salon. It's called Oops, I Put On Your Headset, like as if, you know, you picked up my headset and see what my desktop looks like. Um, that's me at it. So that's you when you're there, if you go see it. Um, it's filled with a bunch of different, like, dorky apps, like a weather app and a you owe money to people app and a phone app, which doesn't do anything right now. Um, yeah, so basically with this, I figured, you know, most of the people in VR in that space are kind of like, you know, men who want to make money. And I figured it's important for the rest of us, men included, um, and people who want to make money included, to think about what you want to use VR for. If this technology is going to take off, whether it's this iteration or you know, whether like the headset thing turns people off too much and it doesn't go anywhere. This kind of like immersive media is here to stay, whether it's like this or whether it's like shooting something into your eye and I, or, or, you know, just having all of these screens around us all the time. So I think we're at a pivotal point where there's going to be many lasting effects, some more importantly affecting us than things <laughs> like this. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I just got to read this to you. <laughs> it says, as Facebook friends, uh, by opting to connect, you agree, your Facebook friends will become your Oculus friends. Your Facebook name will become your real name on Oculus. We don't want everything that we do to be a clone of Facebook, at least I don't, on this headset or in this technology. So, I think uh, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <laughs>